talk about a Jesus revolution. A Jesus revolution. You know, if we really look at Palm Sunday and we look at the triumphal entry of Jesus when, when He came into the city of Jerusalem that week before He was crucified, it really was a revolutionary moment in that city. It was really the excitement that was in the crowd, the anticipation that was in the people, was really a desire for a revolution over the Roman Empire. Now, today we live in a, in a world where the majority of governments around the world today are actually more democratic, republican. We don't see a lot of kings and queens anymore, do we? They've all been kind of overthrown a couple hundred years ago, and the monarchies of the world have really, for the most part, died off. Often that was because of oppressive rules, selfish lifestyles of kings and queens, while the common man suffered that people revolted. And they formed governments by the people and for the people. Now, I thought we would have a little fun this morning. I'm going to share a couple pictures with you today. Because I mentioned earlier being at the Palace of Versailles. When we were in France, you can bring the first one up, William. When we were in France, uh, this is the backside of the Palace of Versailles. This is actually probably about, about one fifteenth of the back gardens of this palace. In this palace there are, let me just make sure I want to give it to you right, there are... 700 rooms, 2,000 windows, 1,250 chimneys, and 67 staircases. More than 20,000 people could actually reside in this palace at one time. But it was the royal residence of the King Louis. King Louis XIV built it up through King Louis XVI when the French Revolution occurred. And this is, you can't even get the whole building in there. Go to the next picture, will you? Here's, a, here's my wife and daughter outside one of the pools that the fountains were going that day. Go to the next one, William. This is one of the fireplaces. That fireplace was taller than I am. You might not be able to tell it from the perspective there, but that fireplace was actually tall. The opening of the hole was taller than I am. Go to the next one, William. That's the Hall of Mirrors, the famous Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles. And uh, it's an astounding room. It's all mirrored on, on one side, windows on the other, with just these, these just elaborate chandeliers. And if you look at the ceilings, there are little just masterpiece works of art all on the ceilings, and all of the gold is real gold that's etched in and that's painted over everything there. Go on, Lynn. This is how the kings and queens live. That's a, just, just one of the thousands of pictures painted on the ceilings. Go ahead. Go through this quick. There's the gates going into the palace on the front side of it. That's all layered in gold. That's all layered in 24 karat gold. This is, now, this is not actually in that palace. This is in one of the other palaces. There's two other ones on the same property. This is one of the bedrooms of, one of, the, of, of Marie Antoinette in, one, in the summer home. Hold on. And this is one of the rooms in the summer home. Keep going. It's one of the hallways. It was closed off to the world. Just marble hallways lined with statues of different uh, French people. And are there any more? Is that the end of it? That's the end of it. I showed you that for a reason. Because, you see, the kings and queens of France lived in this immense opulence. And while they were living in this great opulence, the people around them, there was a famine in the land. The harvest, the last several harvests had failed. The, the country of France was going broke because they had helped the Americans with our revolution. And the people were actually beginning to turn towards cannibalism while the kings and queens lived like that. And that's when we get the story of where Marie Antoinette, and she never actually said it, but the story where she said, let them eat cake. You can imagine why when that spread throughout the city of Paris, why people got so mad so much that they stormed not only the Bastille and tore down the Bastille, which was the prison with political prisoners, then they, the women stormed Versailles. And some of what you even see there isn't even some of the original lavishness of the palace because it was burned and destroyed by the common man because they were so upset in their revolution. See, revolutions have a way of changing the world. They have a way of changing things and changing things in the lives of the people. And if you were, and when you go to France today, it's all about, um, they have this threefold saying, and I'm not going to get it right, but I think it's liberty, equality, and fraternity. I got it. I'm not going to say it in French. But, but it's all about brotherhood, being equal, and having liberty. And that's what we enjoy even here in America because we inspired, actually, their revolution. The day that Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem. The people in the city were tired of oppression. For 400 years, Israel had been dominated by other empires. 
First it was the Babylonian Empire. Then it was the Greek Empire. Now it was the Roman Empire. They were tired of paying taxes to some foreign king, to the Caesars. They were tired of having their monies taken from them. They were tired of being told how to worship. They were tired of trying to have their their lives transformed and their culture transformed by this imposing government that was hanging over them. And they were ripe and ready in their hearts to want to see a change. They knew that there had been prophecies of this Messiah, of a Savior who would come and would transform their world. And they've heard the stories about Jesus. This Jesus who had had made the the lame walk and the blind see. This Jesus who had walked on water, who just a, a week before this, this Jesus who had raised a man who had been dead and buried for four days. And the people were excited. They thought, surely, if he has a supernatural power, that God is upon him, and that this must be the rightful king of Israel, and we're going to get rid of all of our Roman oppression. And the people came out that day to cheer Jesus on and to welcome him into the city, declaring him king of the Jews. Because as soon as you begin saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, it was a call that went out towards anyone in the line of King David calling forth their kingdom and their lineage. And Jesus was actually physically, rightfully there to be king over Israel. He he was in that same lineage of David. And they cut down palm branches and they took off their coats and their cloaks and their, their bedding. They laid them on the road and, and Jesus rode in this, on this young donkey that had never been ridden before. And he rode across the things and they hailed him as king in the streets of the city because they were ripe for revolution. I want to just play our scripture verse this morning. It's going to do something a little different. Would you just run that video? This morning I just want you to just get a little picture. It's our scripture verses for today, our text, but I want us to just watch that this morning. And when he had set distance, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethany and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a short tide, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are tied, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the coat, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawn in near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I don't even think that the video could even begin to fathom what the crowd probably was really like that day when they were calling out to Jesus. There are three things I want to talk to you this morning about revolution. Because I believe that Jesus still wants us to have a revolution today. I believe that God wants us to be a part of a revolution. Our Jesus revolution today really is not a revolution over over modern political kingdoms, but it's really over the kingdoms that exist in people's hearts and in people's minds. It's a revolution against a culture that is based in sinful nature and sinful ways. It's a revolution where instead of following after the ways of this world and the ways after man, where we follow after the ways of Christ. And any revolution begins with the demand for sacrifice. You see, on that day when Jesus came into that city, everyone who sat there and called out to him were making a personal sacrifice in being there. And you can't have any revolution, not an American revolution, not a French revolution, no revolution in any world, in any kingdom ever exists 
unless people are ready to sacrifice something personally. Sacrifice something for what they believe in. Sacrifice something for a principle. And often we think, you know, revolution in some ways can be selfish because it's all about what the basic needs of people not being met. But then in order for it to happen, there has to be something given on the part of those who are fighting that revolution. You know, the thing that we first see in this revolution here this day is that there was a lot of sacrifice taking place that day of people's resources. We have this, this young donkey. Now, a donkey might not seem like a lot to you and I today. Anybody ride a donkey lately? Uh, I don't think so. It's kind of something we do. But, but, you know, I mean, imagine someone coming up and saying, hey, I want your new commuter car. Um, I, I, I'm going to take your car out for a spin. You know, some stranger coming up or something. Your car has value to you, does it not? It means that maybe some of your cars don't, but most of our cars probably do. But, you know, it's like our cars have value to us. This donkey would have been livestock. It would have had value. It had never been ridden before, and that was symbolic because it actually speaks to us of the priesthood of Christ because um, a priest would use something that had never been used before. But he said, I'm going to go take this colt. He said, go get this colt. And if they ask, say, the Lord has need of it. And the first sacrifice we see is the person who gives up their animal to be used by Christ. Once he's ridden, he will have been used. He will no longer have been an animal never used before, but he would have been used. We also see the people taking off their cloaks. And now that, that means something because it was Passover season in Jerusalem. And that meant that there were a lot of people who had been traveling into the city. Now, when you traveled in those days, you didn't go and stay at the local Days Inn or the Motel 6 or, or the Marriott. You, you basically found a place to kind of camp out. And that cloak you were wearing, that was your blanket. That was your bedding. That's what you used to keep warm at night. It might be used which used to prop up your head on the pillow. And if without that cloak, you probably would no longer be warm. But the people were actually taking their garments, their cloaks, and they were laying them down in the dirt for a donkey to walk over. I don't know about you, but I've seen parades with livestock walking over things on the ground before. And it's not exactly what I want the thing I'm going to sleep on to be walking over. You know what I'm saying? But as they cast it down, we see of the resources a personal sacrifice on the people so they could hail this Jesus as king. So they could let him know, we value you. We see something important here. We want you to be our king. And it makes me ask myself, it makes me ask you today, what do we sacrifice for Jesus? What do we really give of what we have? Do we bring to Jesus things that have value? Do we bring to Jesus even things that we have need of? So often we anymore in in modern Christianity, we barely bring to God excess that we have. We sometimes throw a five buck in the the offering plate or or ten dollars here and there like we're going to a movie or something on Sunday morning. But, But we don't bring to God what he has need of. We just kind of throw him our excess. Here's a little bit for you, Jesus, and stuff like that. i got to save the rest of it because we're, we're, we're going to go out for a big buffet after church today. You know what I think? If we want to see Jesus move in our realm, if we want to see a revolution for the kingdom of God happen in our community and happen in the city and the communities around us, what are we willing to give of ourselves to see Jesus be able to work in and to work through our church and to work in the lives of other people? Are we willing to give our resources The other thing these people were willing to give was their own lives. Because, don't kid yourself, what do you think the Roman Empire was doing that the the pilot and were watching out for when they saw crowds of people hailing somebody, king of the Jews, in the city streets of Jerusalem? Every single person in that marketplace who was calling out to Jesus was a target for arrest and imprisonment and even death as a treasonous act against the Roman Empire. Those people knew full well that in order to declare Jesus king, they were making a treasonous act against the Roman Empire and its leadership in that realm. You know, when I think of that today, and I think of how comfortable we are as Christians anymore. We're so comfortable in our Christian lives. We, we, we will serve Jesus, but if it makes us a little uncomfortable, we won't tell someone we're a Christian. If, if, if we feel like we could, you know, if our job could be in jeopardy or something, we won't share Jesus with anybody at work. We won't talk about Jesus. We'll be respectful about all of that. We've become so respectful of the lost in our culture that we're no longer creating any revolution for Jesus. 
and people aren't seeing the difference. And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about being that obnoxious Christian that turns everybody off because they're just so they're so rude about their faith. I and mean, there's a difference between rude about your faith and being truthful about our faith. You know what I'm saying? But it's like they weren't afraid to risk their own lives that day to declare Jesus as king. And I wonder, are we declaring him as king? You know that requires something. You declare yourself a Christian at work, people are going to watch everything you do. You declare yourself a Christian at school, young person, your fellow schoolmates are going to watch what you do. Because as soon as you declare yourself a follower of Christ, people are going to look at your life and what does it measure up to? And sometimes I think we just don't want to do that because we don't want to be challenged with the responsibility that comes with saying, I'm going to be a revolutionary for Jesus. The third thing we see in sacrifice given that day was there was a sacrifice of their own passion. You know, Hebrews tells us that we bring a sacrifice of praise to the Lord when we come to Him. And I, and I love when we come to church. Sometimes we don't always feel like praising God, but if we'll choose to praise God, if we choose to exalt Him, we bring that sacrifice of praise and we see God then come and inhabit those praises in our life and we feel the presence of God in our midst. But there's something that we see that day with such an enthusiasm and a passion. You know, I see a lot of passion for football teams. I see passion for baseball teams, not as much for baseball teams. I see passion for basketball teams and hockey teams. I see passion for a lot of sports and other things in this world. But I don't see a lot of passion for Jesus. Will we bring Him our passion? Will we bring Him the same enthusiasm we would bring to the things of this world? I mean, come on, let's think of it for a second. What is a sport? It's people on a field throwing a ball around. And hanging out. And yet more money is poured into sports every year. More, more time is given to sports every year. More is given into the sporting realm in our nation than probably almost anything else. It's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And yet what enthusiasm and passion are we bringing to Jesus? Do we have an expectant heart? Do we have joyful hearts? Are we enthralled in being able to see Him? Do we bring Him that sacrifice of our enthusiasm? So if we're going to be part of a Jesus revolution... We're going to need to be able to say, hey, Jesus, I'm going to bring you my resources. Jesus, I'm going to bring you my life. Jesus, I'm going to bring you my passion. The next thing I want to talk about is that revolution demands loyalty. You can't have a revolution unless you're going to be loyal to the cause. Amen? Y'all follow me? Because what did they do? On Sunday, they held Jesus, King of the Jews. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And on Friday, what did they do? Crucify him! We have no king but Caesar! How quickly, in five days, did the same crowds, did the same mobs change their attitude, change their story, and instead of crying out to Jesus in the revolution, King, be our king, Hosanna, save us, O king. They were crying out, crucify him! We have no king but Caesar. Why? Because... He wasn't bringing what they expected. They expected a physical king. They expected a physical ruler. They expected someone who was going to free them from Roman oppression. And all of a sudden, Jesus was all of a sudden revealing himself in a different way. And he was going to be a spiritual king. And all of a sudden, he was now captured by the Romans. And he was being led away to be, to be on trial for being crucified. And all of a sudden, they saw his weakness. And instead of being loyal and faithful, they all ran, including his own disciples. They abandoned him. They betrayed him. They left him. They denied him. But you can't have revolution if you don't have loyalty. You have to have loyalty to the cause. You have to have loyalty to the purpose. But the thing is, you have to have loyalty to the leader of the revolution and to what he believes in because the revolution has to be something you believe in in order to be loyal to it. And as soon as they realize that Jesus came to make a spiritual revolution, he came to make a revolution in people's hearts, He came to change the way people lived. He came to make a difference in the eternal existence of mankind. But they weren't understanding that. They weren't understanding what he was teaching. What do you mean, love my enemies? What do you mean, do good to those who harm me? What do you mean, what do you mean, serve those who want to dominate me? that's That's not what this revolution is about. It's about us taking power back, Jesus. But Jesus was coming to change their hearts. You know, when we surrender to Christ, when we surrender our hearts to Him, He comes to give us eternal life, but that eternal life comes with a cost. 
It's free, but it costs us everything. Following what I'm saying? Eternal life in Jesus, it's free, but it will cost us everything. And if we're not going to be loyal to the revolution, if we're not going to be committed to the cause, if we're not going to be sold out to allow our hearts and our lives to be changed, then we're not going to be able to go forth in the revolution that Jesus wants to make in this earth. How many know that Jesus wants to change the world? You know, the thing that I see today is I see the church, I see the, the church being changed by the world instead of the church changing the world. The reason why we lived in a Christian nation at one point where, where more morality and laws were, and it seemed like they were kind of one and the same, it's because that was the influence of Christians upon the world. Now we have no influence. The world has all the influence. And in the church, we're trying to almost come to the place where we're abusing grace so we can look just like the world. But God wants us to be revolutionary in our choices. And that's the third thing I want to talk about this morning. is because revolution demands choice. Revolution demands choice. If we're going to be a part of His revolution, we have to be willing to choose to do what revolution costs. We have to be willing to choose to follow what he taught us. I want you to look at these words that Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39. He says, He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, if we're going to choose to be a part of the Jesus revolution, if we're going to choose to be a part of his kingdom, we're going to have to choose to lose our our lives and surrender our lives to Him. Amen. We're going to have to choose to surrender the way we want to do things. We're going to have to choose to the way we want to live life to the way that He wants us to live life. And so a lot of people want fire insurance today. I don't want to go to... Who? Anybody want to go to hell? I don't want to go to hell. But it's not just about getting fire insurance. It's not just about keeping, making sure we don't go to hell. It's about giving our lives to His cause, giving our lives to what He taught us, becoming like Him. And He says that those who will lose their life, we say, well, that's an awful lot to give up, Pastor. But He says, those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Those who find their life, however, those who find all the things of this world and feed themselves all the things that they desire and and all their fleshly desires, He says, they're going to lose their life. But those who will lose their life for me, they're going to find life. To be part of his revolution, we have to, we're going to have to choose to give our all. And in doing that, part of that is also following the rules of his kingdom. How many know that every kingdom has its own laws? Has its own rules. Well, I thought, I thought Old Testament law, we're not supposed to have to follow that. Yet, you know, Jesus came to, to, to fulfill the Old Testament law, but he gave us a new way of living in the New Testament. This is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, 27 to 38. He gives us rules for kingdom living. Now listen to these, because they are so contrary to society. But listen to what he says. If you don't like it, don't take it up with me, take it up with Jesus, okay? But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Or for him who takes your coat, don't hold back your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, 
and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. You see, the rules of the kingdom, the rules of the revolution, it's a lot different than the way our society lives. Love our enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Turn the other cheek. Give to whoever asks from you. Ah, treat others the way you want to be treated. So often today I see people, well, they'll treat one another the the way, well, they treated me this way. Well, Jesus says, treat them the way you want to be treated. But they didn't treat me well. He says, but treat them the way you want to be treated. Hope for nothing in return. That would be something novel, huh? Offer mercy. Don't judge or condemn. Forgive. Give. And it will be given to you. See, these are principles of kingdom life. These are principles of the revolution. They are so countercultural to our society today. Yet this is the revolution that Jesus was beginning in the hearts of men. No wonder they weren't loyal to him. Because they were selfish. They wanted to overthrow the Roman government. They wanted to take things back for themselves. They wanted to fulfill their own needs and what they desired. When Jesus was teaching them how to give of themselves instead of take for themselves. But he would, before that week was over, he would demonstrate to them just how far he would go to give us eternal life. He would demonstrate to them just how much he would do in order that we could be forgiven. Because the last thing, or the next thing that I want to mention about his revolution, that is revolutionary to the way this world lives, is something that Jesus exemplified when he went to the cross for us. Because he calls us to serve instead of being served. Who doesn't like to be served? Come on, don't we all like to be served? You go out to a restaurant, it's nice when somebody else waits on you. They bring you more water, they bring you more soda, they bring you more food, they wait on you. We sometimes think, sometimes think, well, if I have the more money I have, the more people will do for me. It's how the kings and queens of France lived, that was for sure. It's how kings and queens of most countries lived. They had many servants who always worked for them and did everything for them and they waited around. And the people then, when they became citizens, it was a nobody. They wouldn't be anybody's slave, anybody's servant anymore. But Jesus, in his greatest depth of teaching, teaches us that we ought to serve one another. But I want to be served. No, he calls us to serve. Ambition is a great thing. There was the, a mother, the mother of, of, of two sons, Zebedee, that served Jesus. Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28. Here's a story. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's son came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him, meaning Jesus. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. In other words, Jesus, I know you're going to be the king of everything one day. Make one of my sons on your right and one on my left. I want them to be the next greatest. Mother's ambition, huh? But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? You know, they said to him, We are able. I don't think they had any idea what they were saying when they said that. We are able. Jesus says, so he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. The baptism would be, they would die a martyr's death. They would die for the cause. They would die for the revolution eventually. They would give themselves so much to the cause of Jesus Christ that they would be willing to give their own lives to it. And when the ten, the other ten disciples heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, 
let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, the greatest thing about the Jesus Revolution is it calls us to a place of humility. It calls us to lay down our own ambitions. It calls us to lay down our our own desires, our own want for greatness, and to not be as focused on greatness and what we can achieve and what we can have, but to be focused on what is important to Christ. What is important to Him, which is serving others, which is finding and helping others to find Him, to know Him, to be changed by His love, to have their hearts and their lives turned around and change forever. And it's an example that he set because Jesus was willing to go so far that he would die to serve our need. Let me ask you, how far are we willing to go to help serve the needs of others around us? How far are we willing to go to make sure that others can find Jesus Christ as their Savior? Sometimes we can't be inconvenienced to change our schedule during the week. We can't be inconvenienced to, 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 to give a little extra of what we possess. We can't be inconvenienced to give up our life or even our own passion. We become so self-centered and wrapped up in this world, just like the world is so wrapped up in this world. But Jesus calls us to a revolution. He calls us to a revolution that will demand everything from us. It will demand our sacrifice. It will demand our lives. It will demand our resources. It will demand our loyalty but it will also demand that we serve one another. Are we going to be a part of that revolution? See, that's the last thing. Revolution demands a choice. It's a choice. You don't have to do it. It's a choice. Sometimes that means that that when your spouse is doing something that you don't like, that you choose to serve your spouse. Sometimes when that friend or that family members are doing something you don't like, chooses that you choose to serve another. You see, the whole principle of this all, loving one another and serving one another, that's how we become like Christ. That's how we conform to be like Him. We treat one another the way He treated us, with that same servant heart and love. Would you bow your heads to me this morning? Danelle, if you played that course, Hosanna.